The following was recorded at the CCHF Conference 2023 in Cincinnati. So I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we'll proceed, okay? Lord, thank you so much for today. When I come to conferences, um, typically it's like just really dry. But when I come to the CCHF conference, it is, just fills my cup to be among people that are kingdom focused, to be among a people that are on mission. It just is so rejuvenating. But I just ask that you're in this room today giving us wisdom, your wisdom, that has to do with sustainability. We are all passionate about mission. We understand what it takes in the short term versus the long term to make mission sustainable. So give us your wisdom as we work through this content. May you bless our discussions in this room and beyond. Uh, may you be with us as we connect with each other, because that is one of the beautiful things about this conference, as we meet each other, recognize that we're doing mission in different parts of the country, that we can lean on each other to continue doing your mission where we are. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So. Um, when Steve Noblet came to me, he's like, I would love for you to do a session talking about CFO versus CF no. And I'm like, I did not know that that was a popular thing to say, CF no. <laughs> and then I start talking to people and they're like, oh, that, I thought that was the title for CFO, CF no. Just kidding. Like, that is very common to be called a CF no if you don't do it necessarily the way I would recommend. When I talk about what financial advisors, financial leaders should be doing. It is recognizing that you are a key part in enabling the sustainability of the mission going forward, right? And the point of this session is for three audiences. One, for those that are already in CFO roles to kind of step back and think of, yes, I've been trained to really focus on X, Y, Z, but my role in terms of kingdom building mission work may be beyond the scope of what I was taught in school. And we're gonna talk about that. The next audience would be those that are not CFOs, don't aspire to be a CFO, but may be looking for a CFO. Maybe grooming somebody in their organization to become a CFO, or looking for a CFO, which is the third group. If you are in financial leadership, but not yet a CFO, you aspire to be one someday, this would be a good opportunity like in this room to, at some point, I'm gonna have you raise your hand because people might be looking to hire you, okay? <laughs> so as an introduction about me, uh, my name is Lawrence Rector, but I go by Larry. If you had my business card or saw on the sign, it says Lawrence, I joke that that's my way to know, do you know me or not? If you say Lawrence, I'm like, we don't really know each other yet. So all of you, please call me Larry. Okay, I am married, I have four kids. My oldest turns 21 this fall, and my youngest turns 13. So I have a 21, 18, 16, and 13, right? Um, my oldest has graduated from college this year. My next oldest is going to college this year. So we're very busy at home. I'm sure many of you are also busy too. Um, I've been at Dayspring Health, we're a community health center in Tennessee and Kentucky, north of Knoxville south of Lexington. I've been there about four to five years. Dr. Thomas Joji, good friend, also works there. You may know him. Um, you're not looking for another CFO, right? <laughs> yeah. OK, OK, I'm good. <laughs> um, and prior to working at Dayspring, I worked in higher education for about 10 years. Prior to that, I was in public accounting. Okay, And so that's me, a little bit about me. I'm kind of curious to know about who's in the room. So in those groups, how many CFOs do we have in the room? OK, very good, very good. And that might be all of us at this conference. <laughs> um, how about leaders like C-suite or director at your organization? Just kind of curious. OK, very good. And then I'm curious, any aspiring to be financial leader? There you go. We got the two. You might get to get a job after this session. <laughs> Very good. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be talking to those three audiences through this presentation. This is intended to be pretty high level, philosophical in a lot of ways, not really nuts and bolts. 
And then if you would like to stay in touch on social media, these are two accounts you can definitely use to look for me. Um, that's that. So if you want to be a CFO, you need to learn to say no. Back in my early days, um, which I guess I'm going to say I'm old enough to be able to say I have a younger days, um, the CFO at that time sat down with me and he said, Larry, if you want to be in this seat, you just got to learn how to say no. I'm like, OK. Is that the mentoring that I'm getting right now? He's like, yes, because nobody likes to say no, but in this job, you just say no. I'm like, OK, I'm following. Tell me a little bit more. He's like, anytime somebody brings a proposal to you, you just say no. I'm thinking, that does not sound like a good idea. But that was the advice that I was given. Now, I'm kind of curious. Those of you that are not CFOs, but leaders, through the years, have you ever gone to the financial leader and felt like the immediate answer was no? Just kind of curious, show of hands. <laughs> they must have got the same counsel that I was with you, right? But we would agree that that is. I, I can tell you that. I didn't get a no, it's a hell no. <laughs> hell no. And that wasn't for me, I'm just clarifying, right? <laughs> Right. Um, so why this is so important? What's at stake? All right. The accounting profession is actually dwindling. There are declining numbers of accounting grads and even more staggering declining numbers of CPAs. CPA meaning certified public accountant. Also meaning couldn't pass again, as I like to refer to that test. One of the highest turnover roles in health centers is the CFO financial director. So doing this and doing it well is hard and hard to find. And that's why this is so important to teach. Because what you're taught in school about accounting is a little less incomprehensive to what it takes to be a leader at an organization that's on mission, kingdom focused. Okay? And that's what this tucks into. It's tough, it's tough to find. And it's so important that we are equipping the next generation of financial leaders appropriately. I step back even more. What's at stake? Sustainability is at stake. I remind our board, anytime we onboard somebody, yes, you're going to hear a lot of numbers from me. But that is not the goal. Money is only the fuel. It is not the mission. Again. Money is not the goal. It is, it is just the fuel to succeed at the mission. So it is important. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with leaders of for-profit, non-profit organizations. And when you get into the financial piece, it gets very emotional. Because, I mean, I'll just be honest. I had a conversation with a friend last night. And he was crying because he's like, we're on the brink of collapse. And that is a very common, sad thing. But his mission is not to make a lot of money. His mission is to do what he does. The other thing that's tricky here is we value what we can evaluate. We value what we can evaluate. So those of you that are not in finance, and if you're sitting across the table from somebody that is a financial expert, it's hard to know, does this person have what we need in the role. It's not just like posting activity to a ledger and making financial statements. It is so much more than that. This image is, there's actually a face behind this image. If I was able to like scroll down, you would see it crystal clear. But the idea that if we can't look at it right, you can't see it. So part of this is to just say, let me help you visualize whether you're aspiring to be currently in the role or looking for a financial leader, what to look for, OK? So I like to kind of digest ideas with an acronym. So I came up with JUMP here, this idea of as a next level CFO, you need to be able to juggle the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. You have to utilize data, 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 and more data. You cannot lose focus of mission. 
If, if this acronym could have started with M, it would have been, because mission has to be the start of it. And then present the story with story. As a financial leader, you can't just stand there and show a bunch of numbers and assume everybody in the room knows what you're talking about. You have to reframe it into a story that makes sense. So how to jump to the next level, all right? So let's, let's deep dive. This juggling the past, the present, and the future. So we've got the view of a car. And there's a dashboard, right? We've probably heard of dashboard reports. So this is kind of like the dashboard. And we also have the rear view mirror. Like when I talk about just cash, I can show where cash was. But if I only show where cash was, how does that help me know where cash will be? When we talk to the board and we're like, cash is X, Y, Z. And we have this exciting project we want to do. They don't have enough information technically to help you make that decision. As a leadership team, if you can't actually see out this front window, you're not equipped. And sadly, this is one of the areas that financial leaders in school don't recognize the importance of the future. We're taught so well to be able to talk about the past. We're taught about how to make an income statement, how to make a balance sheet. Yeah, that's great. But that is a moment in time, or that's a moment in time of the past. Sure. That helps me understand, in theory, where I'm going, but that doesn't articulate it at all. Pausing there, have you ever sat in a meeting and you've like thought, what does this balance sheet even mean? Just like honestly, have you ever thought that? Yes. You're like, OK, cool, <laughs> right? Um, and if the financial leader is not actually helping digest that, which gets into, you know, like I've said, story, it's not helping you make strategic decisions. So these are dashboard reports. Because for, for non-financial people, and it's not intended that you can actually read it, it's really just to kind of give different views, you can see story. Like in this, it says sales trend. You can see that there's movement. Up is good, down is bad. Like, if I would have just gave a bunch of data points, that is not informative at all. And I'm sure many of you have sat in meetings that are like, data points without charts are not really helpful at all. And as financial leaders, you have to know to reframe the story into something that is digestible. Okay. And then that past, present, future, thinking to future. How many of you have seen The Giver or read The Giver? OK. So in the story, which I, I, I would love to <coughs> unpack it all, but in the story, this apple, the community can only see it in black and white. But this person has this gift to see beyond, and he can see color. As financial leaders, you have to be able to help the room see the color, to see beyond. And that's what those charts can do. That's what story does, right? Yeah? Um, when you were talking about history and you're helping to look for the future, how far back in history do you like your dashboards to be before they're no relevant? Good question. So the question for the sake of online, I think, um, is how far back of history do I include for the sake of talking about the future? Most times, it's just one year. But depending on like the story, it might be more than that. Um, for instance, in not regular reporting, but maybe annual reporting, I show cash all the way back to early 19. Because part of day string sport story is we had a really bad 2019. And it is a reminder of God's faithfulness and our narrative to be like, those of you that weren't here and didn't get to ride through 2019, which was a journey, this is our story, right? So just depends. Um, and then kind of segueing here, data, data, and more data. Um, 
I want to use data that's not just looking at ourselves. Like I mentioned, day spring. I might do current year to last year. But then I'm also saying, who's our peer and aspirant organizations? Where should we be? Where's the industry say we should be? Because maybe we're better than we were last year, but maybe we're still way worse than we should be. Or maybe we're not as good as we were last year, but we're way still ahead of the industry. So again, that's another way you gotta be able to pull in more than just a few data points. And then really the versus here is the anecdotal information. Like um, I typically will get yeah, well, this one time this thing happened. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have seen some smiles in the room. You've like had this too. OK, that one time is important. I'm not dismissing that. But is that representative of like us as an organization? Is that representative of something that we like, need to be concerned about? Whereas people tend to just like give anecdotal, I want data. Facts are stubborn things. That's a, one of my favorite John Adams quotes. Um, facts are stubborn things. Mission frames all, and I could spend a ton of time here. Um, and I didn't realize that all these slides had the same thing. <laughs> so, mission, I always have to remind that about the kingdom part first. Because it's really easy in our little bubbles to just think about mission where we are. And then sometimes, this isn't to discredit our missions, but it can, you know, effective, quality, affordable, those kind of things, that is us, right? A lot of us are in that boat, but it's like maybe not exciting too. So to give it something like, what are we really doing? Are we transforming lives? Are we transforming our community? Bringing kingdom come type stuff, right? And then how does that work in where we're going? Another thing that is common is being reactive in leadership and especially in finance. Going back to this idea of when you brought a proposal to the financial leader and their reaction was no. Versus let's have a conversation. How does this fit where we're going? Is this part of the bigger plan? Is this part of the strategic plan types of things? Because the, the default is usually like, I'm the only one that cares about making sure there's money, as if nobody else cares about that. And I have felt that tension, right? And I have to step back and be like, no, 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 that's not it. Like, this is just part of our discussion as a team working through a problem, which is a proactive approach versus reactive approach. Now I'm going to hate seeing that transition every time. Um, Mission Drift. How many of you read the book Mission Drift? Good. That's a, almost 50%. So the title is basically referring to, and the book is about, this idea that if you don't stay on mission, if mission isn't framing the trajectory, then you can lose course. Imagine if. Um, I think it was this morning, and Maggie talked about if somebody wanted to give a million dollars, we'd be great, right? I think she made a joke. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you you can't give a million dollars. Let's just imagine that I came to your clinic and said, I have a million dollars I'd like to give you. But can we, like, not do that, take care of the poor anymore? You know, I just, and you're like, uh, that's like our mission. Okay, fine. How about $2 million, right? There can come a point where financial pressure can start putting pressure on, are you staying on mission? And if you're in leadership, I guarantee you've felt that pressure at some point. And if you've had a moment where the finances have not looked like you had hoped they would, that is when the temptation is the strongest. Do not lose sight of mission and being in a reactive situation when it comes to finances which is much easier to say than to do. Um, also, like thinking about finances and thinking about God's work, like there's going to be the deserts. The, uh, did you lead us to the desert to die, Lord? Like, is this it? 
or the, the, oh, wow, it is so bountiful, like, I don't even need to stress about money anymore, like, both of those can be dangerous places. So you have to keep coming back to what is our mission, okay? And then presenting the story with a story. So I recycled this slide because I'm like, well, you know, he's storytelling. If I handed somebody this chart and just said, here you go, it tells you everything you need to know, I'd be like, maybe. Or if I said, we are preparing for an exciting adventure based on what the information is showing. Our patient volumes in recent months have transformed where they were. And we're on a trajectory that I feel very confident about. And I think that this will be sustainable for at least the next six months, but maybe for the next two years. Like these patients are, um, they're a new demographic that we focused on and da 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 da. It's starting to sound more than just numbers, right? I typically start my finance committee presentation with a very high level like, this report has got a lot of positives or there's maybe some concerning elements in this that we want to deep dive on. I'm helping kind of like frame the conversation before we get closer and closer to the data. Do not just fast forward through that. So for those of you in the room that are like finance leaders, this is your chance to tell a story and invite people into the story because the people that you're presenting to can be part of the story and part of where the trajectory is going. Like, most people do not volunteer to listen to financial reports because they like to hear financial reports. <laughs> kind of curious if anybody's like, yeah, I love to listen to financial reports. Just, hey, hey. <laughs> um, we have a finance committee with board members on it. And I'm always like, who's ever going to want to be on this committee? You know? <laughs> And one of them, fortunately, is in a finance like role, background, but the others are not. But they're passionate about the mission. And they want to be mobilized. They want to know, how can I help? And if I don't equip them with the answer to that question, they are not going to be able to do that or enjoy it, OK? So story is so good. So Larry, I've got a kind of a question for you. This has got an anecdotal, and it's got uh, you know, your factual. And so take what's going on, for example, with the banks. Um, you know, as a CEO, if you've got a million or a couple million in the bank, and you hear that banks are closing, um, my first thought is, I wish I had a CFO so I could say, what should we be doing if we've got this money just sitting in banks? Is it your responsibility to tell the CEO and the board what we should do, and do you use anecdotal uh, when there's no history uh, mm. to help you with this decision making? That is, that's a, so that's a great question. I would say it's the financial leader's responsibility to say something into that, because you, believe it or not, you're, you are the most equipped. You may, I, like in those situations, I don't even feel equipped to be like the sage in the room, but that our teaching puts us in position to be that, kind of like a doctor is going to be able to speak into things. I remember back in the beginning of COVID, don't come to me asking me about COVID, talk to somebody that's like got a medical background. Like, um, so what I would do in those situations is if, say, with the banking, my advice would have been, thank goodness it seems to be trending this way, but because of the bank's specialties that they were into, like they didn't represent the types of banks that would be an overrun of like the industry. I, I'm not necessarily concerned that this is going to be an issue for our organization and the institutions that we're part of. And if there was some historical data that I could leverage, that's what I would pull in. But typically when I'm fielding those kind of questions, it is going to feel more storytelling because it's like there's not a whole lot of things I could leverage. Does that help? Yes, yeah, so we could go to the bank then um, for getting that information, um, or where would you? I, I just struggle with how you pull your data points. You know, when you have a board member who comes and says, "Hey, the banks are falling. Wells Fargo's in that list. We have Wells Fargo. What are you going to do about it?" Um, yeah. Like, 
Yeah, I mean, if I had, if my bank was on the list, I'm definitely doing more due diligence at that point. And I think that is appropriate and necessary. Um, and I would not just pull my bank. I would want to be looking at banks in similar industries too, like representative of, the, of our bank. Um, because if I go to Wells Fargo, they're gonna be like, oh, we're good, yeah. right? right. <laughs> Don't take your money out, please, we're good. Like, <laughs> um, so that's why you have to have some counterbalance, right? That's good, I'm curious. Has anybody fielded that question in your organization? Because that's like a, yeah. And how did you respond? Uh, we have a cash sweep account. Uh, it sort of it looks like one account to us, but it's actually it's a treasury management thing where it maintains a balance below two hundred fifty thousand for all the institutions and such, uh, which is an excellent solution for the problem. Uh, am I going to lose my money because I have more than two hundred fifty thousand? So, so it's keeping all of your accounts below two fifty, so that they're at the IC. Correct. It's a little bit, it's a little bit catchy, but it's. I, I picked it for the interest rate but three years ago, but it made me look really clever because it's actually the perfect solution for if you're a mid-sized organization with more than 250, but, uh, but not so big if you have like a treasury management department. Okay. So, I recommend. Good. Good. Anything else? No, we had our investment strategy and revised policy last year or so. Well, the auditors meet us on the field last year. We had more than, you know, we had about a million in one bank and 500,000 in another bank. So, um, over the past year, we have four more bank accounts and 250,000 max in five banks. And we've expanded, you know, all, all our networking with different banks and institutions. But we also did the Interfi. So, we have three $250,000 CDs in one bank with Interfi. They're spread out with three different banks. We have another money market. So it's all protected. The law falls within the internet. So, thankfully, my board the treasurer, the board uh, finance chair, she works at the bank. Um, so that helps having expertise yeah. on the finance committee. Yeah. Which banking is like its own specialty in terms of finance education. CDs is a lot of what we do too because it's like spread across a bunch of different banks at the the CD is issued by a bunch of different banks. So, yeah. Like the T-bills? Um, I haven't, through our organization, um, I, I go the CD route, but the interest rate's similar. I'm curious if anybody else wants to speak into T-bills. Well, our, our investment policy says covered with max securities uh, short term, so less than two years. Uh, we actually increased it from one year to two years because the rate on CD is over 12 months. It's 13 months you can go 4%, not even 5% for CD. So we, tr we try to limit the uh, policy to the short term um, covered with max securities and not get in, make sure we're not doing crypto, those kind of things. <laughs> So very conservative, which most you know, financial people are. So they try to get a little bit of interest on it, then just have it you know, in the ground. Right. Do you have T-bills or you don't? No. So you do CDs? Yes. OK. We have, well, we have money markets and CDs. Yeah. Yep. No, good question. It's like we could have like a whole different session just on like financial strategy. Maybe maybe next year. <laughs> uh, anything else on this? So circling back again, juggling the past, the present, and the future as a financial leader. For those of you that aspire to be a financial leader, don't just focus on the present and the past. Your organization needs you to also help with preparing for the future, because um, it is very common that executive level leadership of organizations, those are the like the big thinker, like these are where I'm trying to go. And as a financial leader, you can be the role that is like, let me help you like reverse engineer the path to that idea. 
let me help you kind of paint the step-by-step -step pieces to get there. Because the dream is awesome and it's mission-oriented, but it, there seems to be like this enormous gap between the present and the future. That financial leader can help kind of paint the path, okay? Utilizing data, data, data. Facts are stubborn things. But when using facts, got to be able to still bring it back to story for the group and then stay on mission. So coming back to that mentoring that I got day one, if you want to be a CFO, just learn to say no. When they come to you and they're like, I know this isn't in the budget, but we really got to do this. All you got to say is no. The conversation is a little more than that, right? I usually kind of come from the perspective of, well, first, is it in the budget or not? Because if you've made a budget, and plug for Katie in the back for personal finance, budget conversations are a lot easier when you're proactive about that than reactive to the situation, right? <laughs> Katie helps me and my wife. And just as a side plug, Katie is great. Um, now, anytime my wife and I have a conversation about money, she's like, can we call Katie? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but even in organizations, that's how it works. Like, if you are good at making your budget, you are really solving probably 80% of the conversation or more in a proactive situation. But th things do come up. Like, there will be situations where things are outside the budget and there's an opportunity. Like, as you mentioned, Rich, like, as finance people, we tend to be conservative. We can't let our conservativeness prevent like the work of the Lord too. Like opportunities might come up. So it's like invite into a conversation. When Joji has a great idea, or maybe not a good idea, <laughs> I don't start with no. I'm like, let's talk about it. <laughs> maybe we maybe you should like do the end of this. Um, it's, let's talk about return on investment, right? Is this on mission? What do we need to shuffle around to make this possible? What does it maybe bring to the table, like in the short term and the long term? Because as organizations, I know you all have these same struggles. There are things that bring money to the table, and there's things that you know will not. And they, those typically be on mission, right? And you're moving the gains here to be able to take care of things here. So that's like the big level conversation that down in the details is don't start with no. Just talk, how do we do this? How do we do this? How can we make this work? And that's inviting them into the conversation. That's inviting them into the solution. Another way, um, this is common in a lot of organizations, is department leaders don't really know what their budget is. They're just kind of like assigned a budget. But they have the responsibility of that department. Equip those department leaders. Bring them into the budget process. And let them have some ownership over the budget, right? Because then they can be part of the conversation of IT, they spend money all the time, right? <laughs> How many stinking switches and laptops, and, and I don't even know what these things mean anymore, that they need? And they're like, we need to buy this. OK. Tell me more. Well, it does this firewall thing, and da 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 and protects us from you know, certain death. OK, well, let's talk about it some more. Like, is this in your budget? If it's not, like, how can we make this work in the short term versus in the long term? like in preparation for next year's budget. Like it, it's not necessarily a no, it's a how do we solve this together, right? And for those that aspire to be financial leaders or currently financial leaders, that is so important. Do not lead with no, because then you, pre you are perceived as a barrier. And leadership is not done well as a barrier. But if you invite people into the conversation, the, end, the answer might end up being no. But you worked on it together to get there. OK? Yes? 
So your CEO comes to you and says, we're going into a new area. It's perfectly our mission. It's a new clinic. It's in an area that's impoverished. We need to get there. And where we'll get the donors is there in that area. They'll support this clinic because it's supporting their community. Mm -hmm. We don't have the funding lined up for the sustainability, but we've got grants lined up that we can build this. And so let's move ahead in faith in the Lord. Yep. Let's go. What, yep. Did Joji you set you up to this question? I don't, we're small enough, I don't have a CFO, and so I have to play all these hats. Oh, and yes. So, um, and then anticipate what my court's going to ask for. So, but I also am conservative, so I want to do this part. Mm -hmm. And so, what does a CFO say to the CEO in a situation where he thinks that that market will sustain with the donors that we get as we build that? If That's you build it, they will come kind of yes. model. Field of dreams. Yeah. <laughs> and not more, not mission not mission creep. It's, it's totally in our mission. Like it is on mission. Totally. Awesome question. And let me for the sake of kind of helping answer, let's frame it in two different ways. So the first way, let's assume there's other people at the table. So in the, well, pretending Joji's bringing that present, presentation to me, or you are taking it to your financial leader, or you're the financial leader receiving the message, I would recommend, let's, let's work on this and kind of, I love whiteboards, you know, kind of breaking it down. Because it starts way up here. Let's break it down and make it more visual, make it more tangible. Kind of getting back to like the data and the story, and making all of that make sense. I don't know how many times we've gone to a whiteboard. Okay. Now the second piece to that is the when there's not other people at the table. I'm kind of curious. Is there any other people that wear CEO, CFO like hats in your organization? A few others. Okay. Um, I'm the CFO, COO, so I at times argue with myself too. Um, <laughs> what I would recommend in those situations is having somebody that's not in the organization as a sounding board. That's what I would recommend, honestly. Um, like, I have people, like I mentioned last night, like a friend. He knows I'm a finance person. He's like, this is the situation, and we kind of like because that's that extra perspective to help you kind of break down the problem. Um, and that might, be, that might be your accountant, right? Um, or somebody that could do consulting work on just like an hourly or just a friend basis. But if you're thinking like a big initiative, it's worth the time and the investment to bring that other perspective to the table to help you process it. That's what I would recommend. Good question. Great question. Other thoughts or questions on that? Go ahead. I guess I would you can just ask yourself why. Once you run through that process, but you know why, 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 why you did a couple of times, you had to narrate that out. And you might find, yes, it's a mission to get, but certainly you that by someone else. Or there's other partners that can come along with and just kind of ask those questions to make it sure because there's no one getting a lot. You know, because you're feeling telling you something that maybe the facts aren't. So you start to dig through that and that just implies you know you may get some facts that could then speak back to you as a friend. That's good. That's good too. That's good processing. And also just count the risks. You know like I mean if there's a and you have a private board, you know, and like if the risks are to so sink us, is that worth it? Like you know like if, if what if what would be the consequence? Doing something that you know, and, and maybe it's worth it. Like this, this is worth the risk. Like every, everybody's on board. Every, I've been, you know, I've, I've been very frustrated with some of those conversations. Like, I really need to do this, you know, and, um, and the board will say, let's wait on that and see how this develops or something. You know, but like, but you know, but going in front of, you know, the, the, the getting counsel even within the organization. Mm -hmm. 
put it before them, and then you know, everybody's in on it. Everybody, you know, okay, like it's worth the risk. Let's go for it. Or as people say, I don't think it's worth the risk. But then you have to just stomach it. You know, stay, stay unified, and generally, you know, it's good. George, you do. Yeah. So I think the kiss of death in what you just said right. is, I feel the Lord. <laughs> Yeah. Telling me that we should do this now, poor Larry has to go against not you or not Joe, but against the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that's my counsel to the non CFOs in the room: be careful how much we're attributing to the Lord, because now he does, he's got it. I mean, I'm powerful. I think the Lord's more powerful than me, and he's got to convince the Lord that this is not a good idea. And as much as you've had that chance to be in prayer and fasting and all, he has it. And so I'm not sure if it's fair to go to him and to your CFO and say, this is, this is what the Lord has laid on my heart. Or even your board. Or no, even your board. Yeah. That can be the kiss of death, too. You can be yeah. The Lord's, the Lord's telling me we should have to do this. Right. Like, right. No, we're not really doing that. Like, right. And I see pastors do that, too. Like they're saying, yes. the Lord's calling us to borrow $60 million to build a new life center. And they say, we're not doing and, you know, like, don't do that. Probably the best thing that Larry's helped because I, I've worked with you know, their CFO prior to Larry. Um, the other person was more CF no wish, and it was no, no, no. And so all of us that had to approach the throne had to go in with a Duke's up kind of mentality. We've got to convince, we've got to use the language of faith, we've got to use the language of the board, we've got to, we've got our defenses up. But the whole idea of having a CFO that is strategic and not a CFO is to say, is, is him inviting me into those conversations, to those discussions, and say, well, let's, let's talk about how we make this work, as opposed to, let's, let me tell you what a bad idea this is. And so I think that that's the, the coolest thing that I've learned in our relationship is, that I can talk, we can talk about it, we can talk about it, and at the end of the day, I own it more than I tell him to own it. I'm owning that whiteboard, I'm owning the performer, I'm owning those conversations and saying, okay, you and I are gonna take this risk together, or you and I agree, this is probably not the wisest thing for us to do. And so, for those CFOs in the room, I can't tell you how important it is for you to be your virtual and to say, let's strategize together. Those words are the magic. But the non CFOs in the room would be God is telling us we have to do this, is a kiss of death. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah. throat that's really tickly and I can't stop coughing so I'm gonna wrap it up but this is really good conversation 
what's at stake? We talk about solvency, the mission, barriers, like strategy. God is working. And in those moments where the Lord has put it on your heart, or the Lord has put it on your heart, or as leaders, like the Lord, don't thwart that for the financial leaders in the room, right? Because just because we haven't heard it yet doesn't mean it's not true. But if you start with no, you're not going to hear about it. You've closed yourself off. But then you still have a responsibility as the financial leader to, like, let's work this out. Because you, too, have been given gifts that are different than the gifts of, say, the other person at the table. And the bright side, when this is done well, when this is done in such a way that is exciting and encouraging and all the things, you get to see like the Lord's work with a front row seat. There has been so many times like that I have gotten to see the Lord in ways that I would have never guessed because taking this approach about doing this well, whether it's in my personal finances or in the business finances, finances is a topic that a lot of people don't want to talk about right, in a lot of different aspects. But the Lord works through these things. So having the perspective of mission and doing finances well can be a beautiful thing. So thank you.